<laughs> On behalf of Namita Gokhale, William Dalrymple, and all my colleagues at Team Book Arts, welcome back to this edition of JLF's Brave New World. A magazine partner for the series is the week journalism with a human touch. Today, even as there's much drama unfolding all the way in the West, in the United States, we go ahead with our first session of the day: sex and the Supreme Court. Justice Madan Lokur, Prithu Dalmia, Saurabh Kripal, in conversation with Namita Bhandari. The Supreme Court of India has, in recent times, set on a path of progressive societal reform. Sex in the Supreme Court: How the law is upholding the dignity of the Indian citizen, edited by Saurabh Kripal, is a collection of narratives that provide insight into landmark judgments that all the rights and liberties of sexual minorities. and women in india justice madan lokur is a retired supreme court judge saurabh kripal is a lawyer and lgbtq activist ritu dalmia is a renowned celebrity chef and restauranter and has stood up vigorously for lgbtq rights and well known journalist namita bhandare who writes on gender and social issues they discuss together the societal and political process that led to these crucial judgments and the role of the highest court in maintaining the dignity and privacy and safety of all of its citizens justice madan lokur served as a judge at the supreme court of india from 4th june 2012 to 3rd december 2018 is presently a judge in the supreme court of fiji and the only indian to be appointed to the supreme court of another country ritu dalmia is one of india's most celebrated chefs and restaurateurs 1993 at age 21 she set up mezzaluna which certainly used to be one of my favorite restaurants in hoskas village in the year 2000 she opened her first diva followed by chittamani her eatery in milan the third outlet viva which is the brainchild of chef viviana versi is one of the most critically acclaimed establishments in italy with a michelin star to its name she has co- co-authored three books authored three books Italian Kana Traveling Diva and Diva Green a vegetarian cookbook Saurabh Kripal reads law read law at the University of Oxford and did his masters in law at the University of Cambridge a self described accidental activist is also a trustee of the Nas Foundation Trust the NGO that first fought for decriminalization of homosexuality in India he is the author of the recently released book Sex and the Supreme Court, an anthology about issues related to law, gender, and sexuality. In conversation with Namita Bhandare, an award-winning journalist with nearly 30 years of reporting experience for various publications, 2013 she was appointed India's first gender editor for Mint newspaper and remained in that position until 2016. She is at present an independent journalist. who writes a fortnightly column on gender for the Hindustan Times and also writes for Mint India Spread and Foreign Policy all our sessions ladies and gentlemen that have been broadcast till now as you know are available on our facebook page jlf litfest and on our youtube channel jaipur litfest jlf please do remember to ask questions and comment by typing it into the comment section below and we will send this these to namita to ask of our wonderful panelists and in case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues you can find us on our facebook page and youtube channels and as you know if we drop off just hang in there and we'll be right back ladies and gentlemen sex and the supreme court saurabh kripal ritu dalmia justice madan lokur in conversation with namita bandare welcome and over to you namita thank you so much sanjoy I cannot tell you how much it means to me to be here amongst old friends in these new and uncertain times. Uh that was a wonderful introduction. I think the only thing missing was the drum roll. Uh, but be that as it may. So when Saurabh uh, asked me to write a chapter for his upcoming book and he he was pretty sure about the title from day one. I think before he got the authors he had the title. and he said it's going to be called sex at the supreme court and he wanted me to write on our workplace sexual harassment and the law the posh law the workplace sexual harassment law and india's me too movement 
and um, if you know Saurabh at all, uh, you know he brings a certain dedication, uh, research, scholarship, and I think above all a certain flair to whatever he does. A very hard man to say no to, and I'm sure my fellow authors would agree with me. Uh, but it took me all the four seconds to say yes, I'm in, and I and and here we have the book. Um, Despite its somewhat uh, provocative title, or perhaps because of its uh, provocative title, uh, there there is a misconception uh, that sex in the Supreme Court is only about Section 377 and LGBTQ rights. It is, of course, but it is a lot more. Uh, you're looking. I think what sort of does as the editor is looks at a streak of judgments, if I can use that term. Uh, that came, that emanated from the Supreme Court in a relatively short period of time, that touched upon some of the most intimate aspects of our lives. You know, the, our very identities. Who are we? Our sexuality, our gender. So whether it was Nalsa and transgenders, um, uh, Justice Mother Loku wrote that chapter. Whether it was adultery, uh, written by Arundhati Karju and Menika Guruswami. Um, Ritu's chapter is one of the most moving chapters, talking about coming out and why she and we. Of course, I don't want to no spoilers here. We we let Ritu talk about her chapter. So from Nalsa to Triple Tala to Shabri Mala to Hadia and adultery and of course workplace sexual harassment. Uh, these were significant judgments and uh, sort of. Let's get get started with you. What led you to write the book? I don't say it was the title that struck you. I mean, what, what really was the thought process behind this book? Uh, well, it's like the tail which is wagging the horse. Uh, probably was no, but I thought it was important. You know, we live in an age of misinformation. Uh, we decry the fact that mainstream media gives all kinds of information which is available. Social media has. Uh, unfiltered in information that comes from all kinds of sources and one of the most important things i think in a democracy especially today is that the citizen must be aware of what is actually happening around her and how does a citizen get information about the law about judgments about really everyday matters that affect him or her other than through the media really there are very few sources so that's why it was i felt necessary to write a book that familiarized the average citizen a lay person so this book is written for the lay person right to have access to a set of legal writing written by of course lawyers but in a easy language it's not a legal textbook it deals with issues which are very very deep uh, deeply concerning each each of us it concerns our very identity as human beings so the book is divided into four chapters it deals with community with religion with workplace and of course your identity the intention was to make a set of essays which are accessible really to the lay person and not only legal essays you see it's one thing to say that this is what the law is and then you're speaking to the person and examining and explaining something to them this was not an attempt to give a lecture this was also an attempt to analyze as to how these judgments have impacted the lives of the people who they were meant for and what is that which caused these judgments to come around so that's why we asked people like ritu and zainab and other people uh, keshav suri who have written chapters about their experiences in their lives and to tie it up as to what is it that the supreme court has decided and what is the impact it has had on their life but ultimately the intention really was namita to make each of these chapters each of these issues accessible to the lay person and put it in a context as well that was also very important the context i think was probably and that is what gives rise to the name of the book sex in the supreme court the context is that in the indian constitution there is a primacy that has been given to the individual above any demand of the community about any demand of religion and that's especially important today i think to, in today's day and time to understand that when there is a braying mob asking for a certain particular view the constitution will guarantee protection to the individual 
and ultimately the sole person the real authority who is supposed to protect the constitutional rights of that individual is the supreme court so the supreme court is the guardian of the fundamental rights protects the individual in the constitutional scheme of things against demands of the majority against demands of the community and this was an intention really of this book and hence the subtitle really the the the, the long title how the laws are i was I, yeah i was, yeah i'm yeah. very sorry but i would to interrupt you here yeah. because I, i was actually going to talk about the subtitle and i want justice lokur to really weigh in on that because the subtitle i mean of course there's sex and the supreme court with its you know dazzling kind of title and then the subtitle how the law is upholding the dignity of the indian citizen so justice lokur i want you to please come in and weigh in on recent events in the supreme court and in the higher judiciary in terms of protecting what saurabh calls the rights of the individual uh you know do you think the higher judiciary has acquitted itself with honor in terms of protecting the right to dis- dissent the right to protest the right against arbitrary arrest uh, would you like to weigh in on this yes uh, thank you namita <clears throat> uh, you see it's like this i think the supreme court has gone through uh, a particular phase at one point of time and that's why you know you had these judgments of uh, hadia nalsa uh, and you know all these uh, cases that are some of them are mentioned over here in this uh, book that was a particular phase when the supreme court was i think a little more liberal than what it is today but today <clears throat> i think uh, in the last uh, maybe about uh, a year or two years um, the supreme court has uh, you know become extremely conservative and one of the reasons i think one of the reasons uh, was the sexual harassment uh, you know case in which the former chief justice of india was involved i think that has led the supreme court to you know kind of get reserved and when it comes to something which the supreme court does not like or which the state does not like in terms of dissent for example you know they just suddenly clam up and uh, in terms of protecting the rights of the citizens if you uh, you know compare what's happening today in the last 2 years uh, with what ha- happened before that for the last of the, for 2 years before that i think there's been a sea change and today it is difficult to say that the supreme court is actually protecting the rights of citizens uh, when we are talking about you know things like habeas corpus petitions and so on uh, i would be kind of surprised you know if uh, some of these cases came to the supreme court now today you know if hadia's case came up today or if uh, the nalsa case came up today i would be kind of surprised if uh, you know we got the kind of judgments that we got at that point of time so yeah there, there has been a sea change uh, well not 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 so good but uh, yes there so personally how do you respond to that i mean does it make you sad because you were once part of this exact same institution you know this great liberal upholder uh, of what you describe as a phase uh, yeah. of liberalism yeah yeah i i am very sad i am very sad about it and uh, <clears throat> in fact i have written a couple of uh, you know uh, articles about this um it's it, it it's it's you know more tragic uh, than sadness you know uh because the supreme court was going in a direction where it was looking after the interests of the people you know fundamental rights are important the rights of the people are important and then you suddenly go into reverse gear you know and you wonder why you know what what is it that has happened that has made the supreme court go into reverse gear that i find to be very tragic you know and uh, uh well, i I'm, i'm certainly not happy about it <laughs> at all <laughs> but uh, i suppose one has to live with it sure justice look i will come back to you on on how perhaps this trend can be reversed and whether it's cyclical but i want to bring ritu in if you don't mind and uh, ritu you um, couldn't wait namita you couldn't wait <laughs> i never can so, so ritu bring, oh, you know, this is Yes, Ritu. Despite all bravado, I have known you now 
since your Metzel Luna days. I think that's what twenty years. I I hate to say this, and um, when my, you were young, question, let's put it this way. When I was younger, and you were younger too, uh, my question really is that I know you as quite a private person, and yet you kind of just put yourself really out there with the petition. And I don't know what it took, but it must have taken a lot. Would you like to talk about it and why you did it? Why you joined this petition? So, Namita, as you correctly said, I am a very private person, and I'm a very shy person as well. And so, for me, for many years before this petition, I'll be very honest with you. I mean, I came out of the closet very early in life. It wasn't a big difficulty for me, as you may have read. My mother accepted it very well. Yet, it was not something I liked to discuss publicly because my private life or who I sleep with was something which was my life, which not everyone needed to know about. And in two thousand seven, I went for the first time. I went for a pride march. I'd never been there before. There was this young girl called Leslie Estevez, who used to be the editor of Outlook that time, who insisted I go for it. And I, whatever I could do, whether it was donations to NAS Foundation, etc., I did my bit. But I never wanted to be in the limelight because I'm a chef, and more than anything else, I wanted to be known for my professional skills and not who I sleep with. And then I have to admit, my partner, my current partner, made a very nasty remark one day when, in 2013, the Supreme Court overruled the high. Judgment, and I was sitting and more bitching people about it. Yourself don't have any business to complain about. Then that was really below the belt, Namita, and it's somewhere it stayed there. That just talking about it is not enough. Just complaining about it in our nice drawing rooms with a group of friends drinking fancy wine is not enough. If we don't do our little bit. We really have no business to complain. And after that, Menka and I were on a flight back from Goa to Delhi. She was taking care of some other case of mine, and this discussion started about the case. And she, you know that how come that there have never been any so-called LGBTQI person themselves who would file this petition? And she just asked me, "If we do this, will you join in?" I didn't even think. I just said yes. I regretted it later. I have to admit, I'm very shameful about it. But I had not second thoughts, third thoughts, fourth thoughts, fifth thoughts. I mean, my company people, my lawyers in the company, they said you can't do it. The minute you announce it, you are technically, uh, you know, calling yourself a criminal. You're admitting to a criminality. We don't know whether you can still remain on the board. I mean, my. Parents, they said, "Okay, we have supported with everything else, but this year." So there were many moments when I regretted it, but I have to admit, the day the 2018 judgment came in, I think everything was so, so, so worth it, Namita. And I always say, I've done. I think I'm not a humble person, and I like to, you know, play my own drums and loud. in clear if that's possible i've done amazing things in my life i've really i'm very proud of so many things of my restaurants but there's nothing that beats the pride and the joy of actually being getting the honor of being one of the petitioner the reality is the petitioners didn't do much huh they also face few reality the real uh, how shall i say this war was fought by this team of lawyers the guy who threw me out of the courtroom many times that's another story for another day so it's really the team of lawyers who actually were our name will go down somewhere as one of the fellow petitioners for the 377 so it's really something i'm very proud of will i do it again not even a second i need to think about i don't think i will regret it for a second i don't know i have lost ritu has no to she is speechless now she can't say i think we've lost we've no, lost, I lost you for a minute i lost you actually i am speech speechless your chapter <laughs> is the one that 
actually moved me and i was quite teary eyed when i read it especially the parts where you talk about um, you, you were suddenly you know you were this celebrated chef and suddenly you started getting hate mail and somebody spat at you at the airport and so it's i i i think you're underplaying it when you say that um, you know you did nothing because you were just a petitioner you you put yourself out there and uh, it takes a lot of courage uh you know to to do to do that i cannot even imagine uh, how much courage it takes uh, sort of if i can bring you in as well how difficult has it been for you to balance these two aspects of your identity the uh, the fact that you are gay and the fact that you are also a lawyer in a in a fairly conservative profession and as justice lokur pointed out perhaps a profession that is getting even more conservative how difficult has it been for you personally well speaking of myself personally at least when i started my career i wasn't really out to very many people but you know this profession like any other is hide bound by class and by the old boys network so let's be clear about that so a lot of what i have accomplished and achieved today is not because of my own outstanding ability which of course as you people know that there is <laughs> but flippancy aside a large part of i had protection because i came from a certain section of society i came from a legal a family with a legal tradition and therefore when i entered it i had automatic protection and as i was working and i carried on i i really felt that it was important for me with all the privilege that i had to come out as a gay lawyer not merely for my own self right it's of course important for each person to identify with their sexuality because it frees you i think any queer person who has come out recognizes that and realizes that but i was also in a position of authority and power and i felt it necessary to come out and be somewhat of a role model to a large number of the queer community the lawyers who are out there and also by virtue of the fact that i had access to sensitize at least some part of the judiciary some part of the legal fraternity that a gay lawyer doesn't have horns on his head i am as human as anybody else my competence must be judged on the basis of my work and not on the basis of my sexuality really and that's what something that ritu alluded alluded to earlier i am a a lawyer who is gay i'm not a gay person who's a lawyer right so it of course it wasn't really very difficult for me because as you said it uh, i i came protected with the baggage of caste and class i think i have suffered somewhat and i've spoken about it recently about the fact that uh, my name went as uh, was proposed for judgeship of the high court it's hanging fire it's always the bridesmaid never the bride uh, for that i think has something to do with my sexuality but that's also important because a glass ceiling doesn't shatter in a day right you have to chip away at it people like me who but yes sorry no matter you're saying what, i mean do you have any evidence that it's because of your sexuality i mean well that is the story of this do you well uh look the supreme court collegium is uh not exactly transparent right and i think the person who can answer that is justice loker right there so let him let him see. yes this is so good would you like to come in and yes, in fact a larger question one would be sorab's own case but the larger question really would be the problem of representation which is who represents the supreme court it's upper caste male you know we make such a noise about parliament having only 14.5% women but supreme court has just two women judges that's what 6% and and the higher judiciary high courts as well and it's not just gender but it's it's also in terms of sexual orientation it's also in terms of caste it is not a representative body yes you're right <clears throat> but uh, you know i think if you look at judiciaries across the world uh, of course you do have uh, you know women judges in uh, different parts of the country but how people get to the supreme court is very uh, different right uh, i was in a program the other day and uh, there were two judges from uh, europe and one of them said which the other one did not disagree with one of them said that there are 50 countries in europe 
and there are 50 different ways of appointing judges right so <clears throat> how judges are appointed is uh, you know something which is a matter of debate and which can be discussed at a different point of time uh, so therefore you have you know uh, things like uh, you know uh, representation of women for example or representation of uh, persons belonging to scheduled castes or persons belonging to uh, scheduled tribes so th th these are matters of uh, discussion but uh, coming back to uh, what sort of uh, you know i know i know that it has something to do with his sexuality you know it 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 is uh, I, i know it as a matter of fact you know so <clears throat> but the supreme court at least when i was there said all right we are prepared to consider him you know let's get a particular report and we we'll consider him certainly but like i said it suddenly became so conservative you know and, and uh, i mean his case has not even been considered for two years right so i have no explanation for that except the fact that it has become conservative and uh, just clamped up you know kind of thing so yes it it is a matter of his uh, sexuality I, i have no hesitation in saying that mm -hmm. How, how a loss i would say a, a loss uh, complete okay loss for the constitution for the judgeship but gain for people like us will have sort of a lawyer i'll just jump in there <laughs> you have other lawyers you'll have you get lawyers but it's it's high time the judiciary just became and it's not just representative in terms of gender but as i said representative in terms of people of sexual orientation in fact as uh, justice lokur points out in his chapter yes. on nansa and on transgenders one of the impact no no i agree yeah one of the impacts of uh, the nansa judgment was that you got uh, india got uh, its first uh, transgender judge in no judiciary but we have a transgender judge so you know things open up um um just as lokur i'd i'd like to stick with you a bit and i want to ask you really a question about the gap you know in the nalsa you are very clear when you're writing about nalsa you talk about a very progressive judgment and all the wonderful things that followed that judgment how things opened up uh, you know states adopting policies starting with kerala and then you bring the pa parliament brings in the law because obviously it is not the job of the judiciary to legislate so parliament brings in a law which is two steps back i think the same thing has happened with with the vishaka guidelines and with the posh act where justice is just not being seen to be delivered and it's not just to do with former chief justice ranjan gogoi but it's also to do with how the sexual harassment workplace act is working out on the ground you know women feel that they are not getting justice men are filing criminal defamation cases this all has a chilling effect so we're, we're in this very uh, uh, you know complicated situation the judiciary should not be making laws but the laws when they come in tend to be very populist or tend to be reactionary or tend not to deliver how do we get around that yeah you see there are uh, two things that are involved <clears throat> one is uh, you know uh, does the legislature parliament in this case uh, does it act in time now uh, the judgment in vishakha's case came in 1998 or 1999 right but the law came in 2013 okay that's 14 or 15 years later why did parliament take 14 or 15 years to legislate all right there's no answer to that now <clears throat> when you have a situation like that you know what is the supreme court supposed to do or what is any court supposed to do I, I, and if a you know a, a woman is uh, sexually harassed at the workplace and she comes to the court is the court supposed to say that listen you know we are, we are not supposed to legislate okay parliament is not legislating so if you get sexually harassed at the workplace what can we do you know the, what happens to the fundamental rights of that person that is the question so there is this interplay between uh, you know the legislature not acting and therefore compelling the supreme court to legislate and then when the supreme court passes a judgment like they did in uh, nalsa you know then it prompts the legislature to come out with a law and that law may turn out to be inadequate and it has been challenged you know the judicial officer that you have mentioned she has challenged the law and the others also have challenged the law 
So, you know, th these are things which uh, it, 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 it's, it's very difficult to balance, uh, you know, uh, the, the role of the Supreme Court and the role of Parliament in certain situations. But uh, I think if, if the Supreme Court continues to be progressive like it was, you know, the legislature will have to wake up and, uh, you know, look into many of these issues. So many of them, I mean, the transgender law, for example, is, is, is uh, th there are defects in it, you know. There are defects in the um, uh, sexual harassment of uh, women at the Workplace Act. So somebody has to do something about it, you know. And if the legislature does Would not... Tell me what are the defects in the Sexual Harassment Act? Well, for one, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that has been uh, debated for a long time has been this uh, issue of, uh, you know, uh, private organizations. So if you have, uh, you know, sexual harassment in a private organization, what do you do? What do you do if there is no sexual harassment committee? Okay. Now, there were, and I think there still might be some high courts which do not have uh, a gender sensitization committee. What do you do about it? I mean, are you going to call up the Chief Justice and say that, listen, you're violating the law, right? Uh, training, I was a member of the gender sensitization committee in the Supreme Court, and uh, we, had, we, had, we had to go undergo training to uh, you know, implement uh, the law because we got a couple of complaints. We didn't know how to deal with them. And we had to undergo training. So there, there, there are a whole lot of things that are involved. You know, it's not just making a law and saying, all right, it's there. Transgender law, for example, these boards, welfare boards, they're not there in every state. What do you do? Mm -hmm. Correct. We are, I'm, ge I'm getting cute that we've just got about five more minutes. So I would like to come back to Ritu. Uh, and Ritu, I want you to tell me how did the 377 judgment change your lives? Because we're talking about judgments and we're talking about lives on the ground. How do judgments change lives? And of course, you've also mentioned uh, your privilege, uh, just as Saurabh has just mentioned it a short while ago, but you've written about it. You've talked about a couple in Jharkhand uh, who were beaten black and blue. Uh, you've talked about a woman I'm, in another, I think. You. Yes. So can you hear? Ritu, can you hear? No. I just want you to. Oh, uh, okay. We uh, sh let's carry on. I'm really sorry because I wanted to hear from you on how the judgment changed your life and the lives of others on the ground. Did you okay. get that? Yeah, a bit of it. So I will try okay. to answer from whatever I could get. First thing, as I'm here, so I'm not such a private person anymore. I've never come and spoken about it on a public platform or any platform at all. But I'm doing that today because I've also realized it's very important to talk about it. It's very, very important. Even if two people hear this or even if it makes an impact on two people, the purpose is solved. So that's one very big change that has happened. Earlier, I used to say that this is it after 377. Now it's passed. My job is done. And now there are a lot of young kids who are going to take it forward because this is the first baby step that has happened. And there's still a very, very, very long path ahead. But what's also changed is that you can't really just say, okay, I've done my bit and it's over. Because once you've done it, you've opened a Pandora's box and you, whether like it or not, you're involved in it for the rest of your life. You know, you talked about the hate mails I got, but what's the most beautiful part, which is the love mails I got, the beautiful emails, messages that I got after this case was won by people in small states, by people in villages who said how it has given them the courage to actually accept it. And for me, as I said, that's, that's the most beautiful gift that I could have really ever, ever received. Also, what I realized is um, not only because of this case, but also because of the book, this amazing book that has this beautiful, I, mean, I feel like a fraud with my chapter in it after reading Namita's chapter and everyone else's chapter. 
was you know i always thought that my workplace was a very liberal workplace it was a very fair workplace and i had all the right rules set that there'll be no discrimination between gender sexuality etc but i also realized that you may set the rules but it never really gets implemented at lower levels because you may set the rule but the most important thing that is needed is to change the mindset of the people who are going to follow it so for us now it's become very important and what we have started doing is i think we've lost both ritu and uh, namita just now i think ritu i think ritu's back ritu did you want to finish that ritu can you hear us I've Ritu, we are on mute. You are still on mute. Uh, not in. I said Namita was anyway not interested in hearing what I had to say, so I will shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> Namita, you are on mute. Wow. technology okay i know we are out of time and i know i need to start with audience questions and I, i'm not getting that little window i'm above in case i don't know where it's gone um sort of just i'm going to give the last word to you and then i'm going to open this up completely to audience questions what are the next frontiers i feel you're already ready to write your next book you know uh i think uh, the recognition of same sex civil unions i mean whether you want to call it marriage or whether you want to call it something else i think uh, marital rape i mean i think these are the areas where we are all, i mean the special marriage act you know we we have two governments talking about bringing in laws against love jihad despite the fact that the home minister has said that there is no evidence of love jihad he said this in the in parliament and yet two governments talking about bringing in act so i think we need to get no matter what what mood the supreme court is in now we going to talk about these new frontiers that we need to open up well you know namita it's a very dangerous uh, time uh, just lokro is absolutely right when you are a lawyer you have certain strategies you choose your battles and you pick your battlefield you do not want to litigate a matter when the court is going to be conservative i don't go to court so that i lose right i choose to go to court because i want to win so there are there are a lot of battles we have to fight we have to fight a battle for gay marriage uh there will be activists who be split about it but i think this is what the people of the community want there are anti discrimination uh, battles that have been fought both on behalf of virtually every uh, this is a question of intersectionality so women uh, transgender community uh, the, the scheduled caste there are battles and battles to be fought challenges are, are, are enormous you know the indian constitution guaranteed equality to women in 1950 we are today in 2020 70 years hence we can't say that a formal expression of equality in the constitution 70 years ago has given equality to women today so you need to go back to court you need to go back to parliament constantly but you have to choose when you go and where you go so i must say the terrain today is not uh, the most conducive for us for some of these battles but that doesn't mean you completely sit back because i don't know how long it will take for the terrain to improve right so you have to put your faith in judiciary and god and i suppose we call uh, judges my lord cuz <laughs> they they got me <laughs> let's uh, not take that too literally <laughs> okay it's all up i'm sorry but i'm going to okay, i'm going I, to so we, that's absolutely yeah because we've got a we've got a question here from anjali varma uh, i don't know who this is addressed to but let me ask the question first you talk about gender sensitization at the workplace i think this is for justice lokur do you see any reforms being made for lgbtq representation at the workplace who yeah. would like to take that yeah yeah, yeah. I, i i think they should be they should be why not uh <clears throat> in fact uh, th th this is one of the uh, you know issues under consideration that uh, what what about uh, sexual harassment of uh, you know uh, lgbtq community uh, it is very important by the way let me tell you that it is very important and should certainly be considered yes 
Correct. Ritu, I know you have in your uh, business, you have made space for greater representation. I, I think the question was to do more with LGBTQ representation at the workplace. Would you like to explain and tell us a little about the steps you are taking? So listen, for me, it's very simple. I mean, the workplace is open to everyone. There is no discrimination between, I would not like to discriminate against the straight people. Let's put it this way. They are nearly as good <laughs> as we are. But, uh, uh, but it's by chance or by luck we had a lot more LGBTQI applications coming to us because they felt it was a safe workplace for them since it was headed by someone from the community. So we have always chosen and we have had a lot of uh, people from the community who have been in the industry with me for years. And honestly, I don't know, I uh, shouldn't say it, it's completely politically incorrect thing to say for whatever reason, and I may get into a lot of trouble for it, but they're amazing people to work with because on, they don't have these hassles of going home at 5.30 to take care of six kids. Okay, so <laughs> I mean, As yet, in some ways, it's really, really, really wonderful. Yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. Correct. But Correct. Okay, there's yes, another question. As I was no, telling you before, which I think I got cut off, is one thing we realize. Uh, Ritu, I'm going to ask another question. I have another question here from Sanya Bhutani. She wants to know about the intersection of the queer movement with other movements and communities. I think that's a very clever question, you know, the kind of a, creating a larger um, conglomerate of activism, uh, you know, with, with the feminists, with Dalits, with Kashmiris, with environmentalists, and with all the supporters of a secular India. What do you say to that? What, what fun. I can't wait. I want to be part of it. I think there will be so much drama. There will be so much theater. Life will never, ever be boring again. That's for sure. Correct. I mean, just uh, jump in there, Sri. Is that I think that is an, sorry, an extremely important thing to do. These intersectionalities yeah. is, is not really... See, A, it inflates our numbers, right? So there is a... a set, a pragmatic sense to it, to ally with other marginalized oppressed communities. Uh, so it's a practical lesson. But I think more importantly, as it's a question of empathy. As members of the queer community, I think we have been disadvantaged and consequently, we owe it to ourselves and our humanity and the humanity of everybody else who's equally oppressed to ally with them, not just for our rights, but also for their rights. Because till we do it together, I don't think we will be fully achieving the society we want to live in. We can't have a fair society where the queer community is, is valued and the uh, marginal, other marginalized communities, uh, the Dalits, uh, women, are oppressed to have a society like that, right? So it's important to move together. Correct. So Sahil, we, I, I, for some reason, all the questions are to do with Section 377 and LGBTQ uh, rights. There's another question from Sahil who's asking, since uh, Section 377 was amended on September 6, uh, 2018, to what extent is the new law applied and helpful to members of the LGBTQ community? I think Ritu has dealt with it to some extent, but we can come back. Uh, uh, Saurabh, I think, would be a better person to answer. Saurabh? Yeah. Because he's dealing with a lot of cases. He's heard of a lot of cases that has happened post-377. Right, Saurabh? Yes, well, that's true. I mean, this is a, it's a beginning of a change. There's a long, long, long way to go. I think uh, there's, there, are, there are battles to be fought. It has made a difference. Uh, of course, I think more importantly than anything else, it's the fear of prosecution which has gone. And that has liberated a lot of activists and a lot of people to come out openly and express their sexuality. And there is, you know, the, the obvious openness that happens and discussion, the more discussion that happens on, on this issue, that, that's, that's important. One of, the, one of the biggest problem of being in the closet was the fact that every, the people, the issue itself has now come out of the closet at least, and now we're waiting for the rest of the members to follow. And this judgment has made it easier for people to come out, I think. Right. If I may just add um, one more thing I there. Know. Yeah. No, I was just Go saying ahead, this, 
this year especially has been an amazing year for whatever strange reason have people you know done a lot of introspection or what it has happened during covid time but this year personally i mean the judgment was passed in 2018 but i have found 2020 to be a very particular year where a lot more is being talked about it than it has ever been it has ever i mean i've had more invitations to go and speak to school teachers mothers and school kids across the country, you know to i can't explain to you i've done i think sort of you'll agree i think i don't think you have talked so many times over various platform as you've done this year on this subject it's an issue whose time has come i think that's yeah. basically what it is like the me too movement really namita your chapter says in 2018 with the me too movement right Correct. i think the spark that is also set off the the queer movement and each of these movements and you talk of intersectionality earlier there there are times for each movement so the be the black lives matter with george floyd we waiting for a dalit moment in india possibly for there to be uh, uh, so each of these have what triggers it but the fact is something has been triggered in the indian consciousness really and therefore i think the queer movement is here to stay Yeah. I hope so uh, because I know that the Me Too movement has caused a huge backlash, and any um, any challenge to the patriarchy, wherever it comes from, is going to face uh, resistance. Uh, you know, uh, uh, all of us in the women's rights uh, movement are, are are facing this. Uh, Dalit women are facing this, where where violence is routine, and we're not even we're not even begun those conversations. Uh, uh, you know, so. Yes, but I, I think the box is open, Pandora's box, or whatever box you want yes. to call it. And I think uh, there is no going back. I think it's uh, onward and forward. Uh, thank you very much, uh, all of you, Justice Lokur. Your your candid comments. Uh, I know I took you a little bit away from the book, but uh, always frank and honest. uh um uh, you know i'm afraid to speak your mind uh, thank you so much for your perspective sort of thank you for bringing us all together with this uh, remarkable book ritu you are amazing and uh, you're not and a fraud namita you are now honorary member <laughs> <laughs> yes. and just and just thank you i shall wear that with great pride <laughs> yes <laughs> that book <laughs> um Back Thank to JLF. You. Thank you for having us here, Sanjoy, for putting this together. Great effort. Thank you so much. Namita Bhandare, Saurabh Kripal, Ritu Dalmia, Justice Madan Lakur. Thank you so much. The takeaways, as Saurabh said, uh, you have to time taking a case to court. The idea is to win. The idea is to bring about change. Justice Lakur very pointedly reminded us that the court has lurched to the conservative side. it's become far more closed uh justice lokur you were really the shining light for many of us who look to the supreme court uh, for protection of uh, personal rights uh, we do hope that will change again in the years to come uh, sorob we do hope that you find a place in the court uh, more importantly i think the book that you've written every chapter needs a session uh, this has not been able to do justice to it because every chapter has a story behind it has a motivation and as namita said those incidents that drove each chapter to make that difference that is important because the more we are able to tell that story ritu your very story of bringing hope to those who know no hope people like all of us are privileged and sorob mentioned that a, a, a couple of times but those people out there who have no access neither to language nor to the networks that we are part of what do they do and we've seen that be it in hatras or so many of these other places the lady in madhya pradesh where the court said you had to tie a rakhi because she had been raped i mean you know some of these judgments need to be absolutely revisited but thank you all so much it 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 was a thank you sir joy brilliant and fascinating session and i hope all of you watching out they enjoyed it we're sorry we couldn't take all the questions because as you saw there was so much to talk about uh, but we do hope you'll be back at 8:30 pm for 
Brave New World, COVID and the Arts with Anand Padmanabhan, Shashi Tharoor, K.R. Meera, Kanishk Gupta, Marcus Dusatoy, Namita Gokhale and Urvashi Butalia in conversation. It's a session which explores resilience and innovation. I'm using the word resilience again. And innovation from the arts to the isolation and extreme disruptions of the pandemic. Writers, artists and book lovers speak of responding to unforeseen challenges and the creativity and solidarity that rose to the fore during these difficult times. This session was part of the Frankfurt Book Fair program, which was a digital program this year. Uh, please also remember, we've got JLF Brave New World Voices of Faith, a new series. The next session is on Saturday, the 7th of November at 7.30 p.m. And that's with Ram Charit Manas, then and now, Pavan K. Varma and Pushpesh Pant in conversation. Uh, Pavan Varma's The Greatest Ode to Lord Ram, to Sidas's Ram Charit Manas, has attempted to deconstruct Hinduism by analyzing the plurality and diversity that exists within its philosophical roots. This has been presented by the Kamini and Bindi Banga Family Trust. Also, just to remind you all, block your dates for JLF North America. This begins uh, this later this month or later this week. Uh, we have four editions starring Nobel laureates, Man Booker and Pulitzer Prize winners. Eric Cornell, Jan Martel, Michael Sandel, William Caleb McDaniel, Vijay Shashadri, Stephen Greenblatt, Vikram Chandra, Amish Tripathi, um, Ira Mukhoti, and so many others to discuss issues, including the present ongoing American elections. Another state has just flipped, for those of you who may be interested, uh, to Biden's side. Uh, Black Lives Matter, which we talked about just now a little while ago. Of course, environment, history, science, travel, Nation and Identity, Fiction and Poetry. This is November 8th to 11th, November 15th to 18th, JLF Colorado. November 21st to 22nd, uh, JLF Houston. November 23rd and 24th, JLF New York. And we conclude with JLF Toronto, November 27th to the 29th. Stay safe, see you back at 8.30. Thank you.